Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa by Voter J. Hanegraaff, Ph.D., with commentary. In the opening scene of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust tragedy, we meet a scholar in despair. The aging Johannes Faust has spent his life studying philosophy, law, medicine, and theology too, unfortunately. But sitting now in his study, surrounded by dusty books, he must admit that it has all been in vain. None of the human arts and sciences has brought him the knowledge and certainty he has been looking for. So now there I stand, poor fool that I am, still as ignorant as before. Finally, as a last resort, he decides to try magic, hoping that perhaps some spirit may reveal to him the secrets of existence. That I may learn the innermost power that holds the world together, behold its active powers and seeds, and no longer need to babble mere words. He proceeds to evoke the spirit of the earth, but with doubtful result. The spirit does appear, but treats him as an ignorant earthworm and departs in contempt. Eventually, however, there comes an answer to Faust's desperate attempts at contacting the mysterious realm of the occult. During a walk through the fields, he is approached by a black poodle who follows him back to his study, where he transforms into his true shape, Mephistopheles, the devil, who proceeds to offer Faust what he wants in return for his soul. It's interesting, um, the other day I saw a debate online about the devil and Satan, and, and they were saying that the devil and Satan is a Christian invention from the Christian Bible, and that Satan is more true if you're working with uh, Goetic spirits, because Satan is, or no, Lucifer. Lucifer is more true if you're working with Goetic spirits. Uh, this was uh, something talked about by S. Connolly in, in the Demonolatria work uh, she does. And uh, so some some people like to work with Lucifer because it's more of a true uh, demonic spirit and rather than the Christian Lucifer or or Shatan, Satan, from the Christian Bible. But so let's just get some things clear here right away out the gate. Um, Satan is not a Christian invention, and the word Shatan couldn't appear in the Christian Bible because it's a Hebrew word, and there's no Hebrew, really, in the Christian Bible. It's in the Jewish Bible. It's in the Hebrew Bible. So, And it appears twice in, in Job and one other place. Um, and it does mean adversary. Um, Lucifer doesn't appear in either the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Bible at all. What it does appear in is the Latin Biblia Sacra Valgata, the Latin translation of the Hebrew Bible. And it's because there is a being that carries light, uh, Bokar Or, this being is the light bearer. Um, among the Elohim, the Council of the Gods, as it's best translated in the context of the, this part of the Hebrew Bible. And so this being that carries light in Lucifer is Lucifer, light bearer. Um, whether that, that became conflated with the, the devil and Shatan much later by Christians, but not in the New Testament. So let's be very clear on that. None of those names um, come nascently out of any form of pure... Goetic or demonological uh, sources or covels, you know, these are things that debating which one of them is more germane to a pure demonic tradition that predates Christianity and Judaism. It's that's just that's just poor critical thinking there and uh, not good research. So these names pretty much all come around in these in the Hebrew and Christian texts. Now, does do some of them get inserted into that text, especially the Hebrew text from older traditions? You betcha. Do we have all those tr the sources and traditions? No. Sadly, this big library burned down, and we've, we've had a hard time tracing a lot of stuff since then. So that's uh, moving on with this. After we deal with the <laughs> demonological issue, for those of you that are fascinated, um, I think it's important to remember, I think it's the chaos in me that, that likes to say, like, if you really look at the origins of this word or that word, look at where they come from, you usually end up in a place where you realize, look, they're, they're, just, they're just words, and uh, what they mean is more important. 
um, understand their history of meaning before you come up with your own, perhaps, or not. Just make a new word have a new meaning if you want. And uh, the only problem with that is when you try and expect other people to uh, have the same meaning that you've invented in your mind. That's not so useful. So be careful with that, that little trick there. Among the most obvious models that were used by Goethe to create his Faust figure is the German humanist, intellectual Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, 1486 to 1535 slash 36. We don't know exactly when he died. Agrippa's On the Uncertainty and Vanity of the Human Arts and Sciences and the Excellence of God's Word, 1529, that's back when they knew how to create a good long book title, is a work of thorough philosophical skepticism about the vain pretenses of mere human scholarship and learning. As Goethe's Faust discovers after a lifetime of study, none of it can give us true certainty and knowledge. Reminds me of, I think it was Thomas Aquinas, I believe, who wrote the Summa Theologia. And the story is, whether it's true or not, when he died, he has to be dragged out into the mud and in the rain. Or maybe I'm conflating that with, with Francis of Assisi, but definitely what Thomas Aquinas, I believe, said at the end was, everything I have written is just straw. So he, he too acknowledged the limits of and, the, and sort of the futility of human knowledge to reveal things beyond human grasp. This is a, a theme with any, any great intellect or uh, thinker in all of human history, the limits of knowledge. But Agrippa is most famous for his other major work, his Summa of all the traditional magical arts known as Three Books of Occult Philosophy. 1533. Could it be, as Faust hopes, that where mere book learning fails, magic can provide the answers? In fact, Agrippa did not consider his three books on occult philosophy as a reaction or an antidote to the intellectual skepticism of his previous work, as some later commentators have assumed, but they certainly established his doubtful reputation of a master of magic who might well be in league with the devil. Agrippa actually owned a dog, a black poodle, whom he fondly named Monsieur, and already during his lifetime this gave rise to rumors that his closest companion was a familiar, a demon in animal shape. Clearly, then, the Agrippa of the imagination must be distinguished from the real Agrippa. If the latter is the subject of properly historical research, the former belongs to the domain of nemo-history, from mnemonic, so Nemo history, that is to say the history of how we remember the past. Nemo historical narratives are subject to continuous change and are often factually incorrect. Entire generations have remembered Agrippa as a black magician in league with the devil, but their power can be so overwhelming as to make us lose sight entirely of the historical figures hidden behind the screen of our collective imagination. In the rest of this contribution, we may well try to dispel the myth as best we can. Who was the real Agrippa? He was born in Nettesheim, near Cologne, Cologne, in a family belonging to the middle nobility. From 1499 on, he studied a humanist curriculum, first in Cologne and then in Paris, after which he embarked on years of travel and adventures of all kinds. During his early life, Agrippa served in the army of the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I. But he kept studying, and in 1509 gave his first academic lectures at the University of Dole in Burgundy. His topic was the first large book by Johannes Reuchlin, the great authority of Christian Kabbalah. In this important work, De Verbo Merifico, The Word That Creates Wonders, 1494, Reuchlin divided the miraculous arts of the occult into three categories— physical practices concerned with the sublunar world, celestial and mathematical practices, especially number symbolism and astrology, concerned with the world above in the sphere of the moon but below the fixed stars, and religious or ceremonial practices concerned with demonic, angelic, and divine realities above the stars. Reuchlin used the term magic, magia, only for this third and highest level and added a subdivision of superstitious goetia and religious theurgia below it. Henceforth, Agrippa would adopt the same scheme, but he decided to use magia as the umbrella term for all three levels or worlds. Right afterwards, in the winter of 1509 to 1510, 
Agrippa visited the abbot Johannes Tritemius, a famous authority on cryptography and demonology. The two men seemed to have agreed that it was time to restore the ancient reputation of magic as a divine art, and Agrippa set himself to the task of making the argument. In the same year, 1510, he produced the first draft, still in only one volume, of De Occulta Philosophia, dedicated to Trithemius. It remained unpublished for the time being. From 1511 to 1518, Agrippa lived in Italy, the homeland of Renaissance culture, where famous authors such as Marsilio Ficino and Giovanni Pico della Mirandola had created an intellectual revolution, grounded in what may be called Platonic Orientalism. This modern term refers to the widespread conviction that Plato and later Platonists represented an extremely ancient tradition of supreme spiritual and not just rational philosophical wisdom that had originated not in Greece, but somewhere in the Orient. And this is behind uh, Hanograph's previous argument that he's made, which I haven't covered yet, but I've touched on later papers, um, where the term hermetic tradition and the grand narrative created by Francis A. Yates should be overturned for the term Platonic Orientalism. So I haven't really covered that paper yet, but you can, you can go read it and I will cover it soon because I do have a bunch to add and a lot of opinions on why he's doing that due to the current state of academia uh, and uh, especially funding in religious studies departments versus other departments and the popular occult milieu in which we find ourselves. So that'll be interesting when I do get to it. But there we go. So the, the central argument is that the tradition of Hermeticism, quote-unquote, extends further beyond Greece into the ancient Near Eastern world and, and even farther. Um, and that's why the word hermetic is poor to encompass all of it. Like his predecessor in this regard, the Byzantine philosopher Gemistos Plethon, Ficino himself thought that the ancient wisdom tradition had originated in Persia with Zoroaster, the chief of the Magi and supposed author of the mysterious Chaldean oracles. Giovanni Pico della Mirandola had a different opinion. The supreme wisdom could not have originated with a pagan sage, such as Zoroaster, but must be found among the Hebrews. He claimed that at Mount Sinai, Moses himself had received not just the tables of the law, but also a secret revelation intended for the priestly elites. This tradition was known as the Kabbalah, and it had been preserved by the Jews and had now been rediscovered by Pico himself, who claimed that its basic tenets came directly from God himself and therefore had to be Christian in essence. This is a very common argument, of course, that anything true in another culture or religion is essentially Christian because Christ Jesus is everything. We all know this sort of argument. But next to the Zoroastrian and Mosaic interpretations of Platonic Orientalism, read Hermeticism if you want, there was yet a third option which pointed to the legendary Egyptian sage Hermes Trismegistus as the ultimate source of wisdom. The most explicit exponent of this third hermetic variant was a little-known Italian humanist and poet Lodovico Lazzarelli, who I have covered before. Next to the Bible, his basic reference was a collection of Greek texts known today as the Corpus Hermeticum, 14 of which had been translated into Latin by Ficino, first published in 1471. And the complexities of the iterations of translations and interpretations and, and all of that brouhaha, of course, I have covered before. While three additional ones had been translated by Lazzarelli himself, first published by Symphorian Champier in 1507. These backgrounds are crucial for understanding Agrippa's lifelong project of restoring the occult philosophy grounded in the ancient magical disciplines. In 1515, he was lecturing in Pavia about Ficino's Pemander, his 1471 translation of Corpus Hermeticum 1 through 14, named after the divine figure Poimandris, who appears in Corpus Hermeticum 1. And although the lectures themselves are lost, we still have Agrippa's introduction. One year later, in 1516, he wrote a dialogue on man, in Latin, De Homine only the first part of which has been preserved, and finally, a complete text known as On the Three Ways of Knowing God, De Triplici Ratione Cognoscendi Deum. All these texts are permeated with references not just to the Hermetic writings, but more specifically to Lazzarelli's ideas about the profound unity and harmony between Hermetism and Christian faith. 
remember for some of you who are first-time listeners, uh, her hermetism is generally used when referring to the source documents of the Emerald Tablet and the Corpus Hermeticum, whereas hermeticism is used when referring to the re, uh, reformation of it in the Italian Renaissance up to present day and the practice of it, the hermetism spirituality. Agrippa knew Ficino's Pimander, of course, but the truth is that this famous translation is not very helpful if one understands, one wishes to understand the religious message of the Hermetica. Ficino simply does not seem to have understood it all too well, and therefore it must have been puzzling to Agrippa as well. Lazzarelli, however, did understand what the Corpus Hermeticum was all about, probably better than anyone of his generation. It's funny to me always how often, um, in retrospect, we can see that the people who understood something the best are often the ones that uh, were not touted or made famous, but it's the misinterpretations and the misunderstandings that are often what become popular until several hundred years pass. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Next to his translation of the final three treatises, he had written a beautiful neo-hermetic dialogue known as the Crater Hermetis, the mixing bowl of Hermes. And this text leaves no doubt about Lazzarelli's profound knowledge and understanding of the message of spiritual salvation that is central to hermetic writings. It was published for the first time in an abridged version by the French humanist Jacques Lefebvre de Taple, I always get that wrong, in 1505, and this is how Agrippa knew about it. Lazzarelli's Crater Hermetis is in Lefebvre's 1505 edition may well be the key to Agrippa's worldview. His Italian writings, listed above, show that he read the Hermetica entirely through a Lazzarellian lens, which would mean, of course, he had the, perhaps as a magician, had the only accurate view of it, uh, because uh, Ficino and Mirandola and, and others were reading faulty translations, for specifically making the fallacy, as I've talked about before, making the fallacy of mistranslating a part of it that says that it is uh, rational reason and thought that leads us as far as we can go, and that's a mistranslation of the line in the Hermetica, which should actually read um, it, that you have to go beyond that to something higher, essentially intuition or divine uh, inspiration. So that's quite a major mistranslation that only Ludovico Rat Lazzarelli really had uh, on point. So the others were uh, lost in the realm of rationalism, while Agrippa was aware he had to go beyond that. It's a really, really amazing discovery and, and uh, thing that has been noticed by modern scholars of esotericism. Not that we didn't all know it, of course. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's the core of any form of mysticism. And when his three books of occult philosophy were published almost two decades later, they still contained the same essential message. At first sight, though, it might seem as though his famous work is little more than an erudite but derivative compendium of traditional magical lore. Its overall framework is the classic Aristotelian cosmos with the Earth at the center, the Moon, and the other planets circling around it, and the stars and the constellations fixed on the interior side of the cosmic sphere. Yeah, we would have had a better understanding of that much earlier on if we hadn't killed uh, Hypatia. Wasn't that her name in Egypt, in Alexandria? I don't know. Yeah, shouldn't have killed the scientists figuring everything out. Beyond that sphere are the angels and divine realities, since the four elements that constitute the earth are supposed to be inert. The active powers responsible for movement and life must come from above. And hence, it is entirely logical to assume that higher powers or virtues from the stars or even higher entities can be drawn down by means of magical techniques, such as invocations or the use of amulets and talismans. The movie, by the way, about that covers that uh, interesting episode with it's Hypatia, I believe, not Hippolyta, yeah, but um, uh, is called Agora with uh, Rachel Weiss. So that's a, that's an interesting, yeah, it's, a, it's heartbreaking, but, but good to know the story. Essentially, what Agrippa is doing in his three books of occult philosophy is going through all the levels and realities that exist in the cosmos, while discussing in considerable detail what the ancient authorities tell us about their nature and powers. He does so by starting down below in our world with the four elements, working his way upward to the world of angels and God himself. This procedure is chosen not just for didactic reasons, but as 
has a spiritual dimension as well. The downward movement of magical powers or virtues that can be draw, attracted from above finds its complement in a mystical upward movement through which the human soul distances itself from the world of matter and of the senses and draws ever closer to the divine origin. So this is that's an essential message in the Corpus Hermeticum that uh, Ficino uh, and others got wrong in translation. And Ficino was rushing, remember, because Cosmo wanted to read it before he died, and that's why he fast-tracked that. So how did we get separated from the, that origin in the first place? For both Lazzarelli and Agrippa, the answer was obvious. It was because of the fall of man, as narrated in Genesis. In itself, this opinion may sound traditional enough, but under the direct influence of Lazzarelli's Crater Hermetis, Agrippa went far beyond current theological views in highlighting the original divinity of prelapsarian man. Before the fall, man was literally, and not just metaphorically, the image of God himself. In Hebrew, the word for image is tselem. And it refers to also just the whole body of light in modern Kabbalah. As a perfect microcosmic reflection of the macrocosm, he embraced in his own being the full plenitude of all natures and substances that exist in the whole universe. And the reason he's called Adam is because Adam comes from Adama. So Adama was, you know, Adam, Adam was made from the, uh, from the earth from Adama. And Hebrew has a lot of word plays in, throughout the Bible because that's how they do it. 30 days and 30 nights just means a very long time. It wasn't a special number. Three days and three nights. It's just, these, are, these are tropes. Same as like uh, uh, tohu ve vohu, chaos and desolation. It was all, oh, it was crazy. It was tohu ve vohu. Um, and you can check more of that sort of issue out in the commentaries of the Bahir, Sefer Bahir which is my favorite of the early three Kabbalistic texts. Although his body was made of discordant and contrary elements, making it mortal, at least in theory, God had made sure that it would never have to fall apart. It was inhabited by the divine light itself, which continually imposed peace upon the elements. That is to say, kept them in a state of harmony and balance, and thereby ensured eternal life. It's interesting how um, in Kabbalah, the tree of life so it represents the perfect unity, but it's in knowledge, in the invisible sephira. Gaining knowledge is what creates the imperfection of our harmony. So knowledge is that thing that brings us into the abyss, into the clepothic tree, the shells, the shattered vessels, um, when Adam and Eve consumed knowledge from the tree. And uh, that caused an imbalance. The knowledge is the imbalance of us. So it actually makes sense that moving beyond knowledge and everything that's just straw is what raises us back into perfection and the eternal glory of our soul or eternal afterlife, if you would, however you want to see it there. It's uh, very interesting. But all this, all of the, that changed due to man's transgression, which in Agrippa's view consisted quite literally in the sexual act. So, yeah, not in the getting of knowledge from the tree. Um, but, yeah, the sex thing was a big, a big issue for these guys. 600 years ago. Offended by his this carnal behavior, the divine light withdrew, the harmony was disrupted, and the body became subject to illnesses and decay, finally leading to death. Echoing Lazzarelli's formulations, Agrippa says quite literally that because he embraced the body, man fell from the luminous sphere of contemplation in this, into the sphere of carnal lust and darkness. I think there we can really see Agrippa's own issues and uh, opinions coming through because if you if you if you did the what the biblical scholars uh, often require and even religious people and look for proofs of the scripture by the scripture itself so look for a reason within scripture before you look for a reason outside of scripture why something is the way it is it says quite clearly in genesis 6 1 to 4 why humans were had their infinite lifespan redacted to maximum of 120 years. And that's the issue with the Nephilim and all that. And of course, I have one of my academic exegeses on that subject, but I mainly look at linguistic issues and other things that are boring and hard to understand for most people, according to the reviews. So I wouldn't check out my book on it, but there is another scholar who went and did a fuller study ever since me. And uh, that's a really good one, which I myself look forward to dig into in my later years for fun and might even review my own work and expand it. Who knows? Who knows? Sometimes when you do something 15, 20 years ago, it's just good to leave it where it is. 
<clears throat> so yeah, Agrippa uh, looks at sex being the problem. The, a lot of modern Kabbalistic views would, especially hermetic ones, would look at gaining knowledge from the tree to be the transgression. But according to the Bible, the transgression um, happened later on. Um, though, of course, that could be limiting from extensive lifespans to shorter lifespans. So that could be a secondary issue now that I think about it more critically. Um, so the transgression is either the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil or it could be the sexual act. Um, that took away immortality, and then that limited the lifespan even more was the, you know, the Nephilim issue in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. There you go. So this is why we find ourselves living in mortal bodies in a material world, forgetful of our original divinity and immortality. So this is again an etiology for why humans aren't immortal. Of course, we know that humans have never been immortal, so it's all quite interesting from a mythological point of view. It all happened because man chose the path of carnal generation, that is to say, sexual reproduction. The tragedy, according to both Lazarelli and Agrippa, is that he thereby lost his divine powers of spiritual generation, a superior alternative to sexual reproduction that results in the creation not of bodies, but of souls. And this, they claim, is precisely what the process of spiritual ascent is all about, while human beings are capable of drawing down divine virtues on all levels of the cosmos, their ultimate goal must be, rather, to rise up from the things of the body to the things of the spirit, thereby reversing the effects of the fall and regaining their original status as divine beings who will be procreating for God and not for themselves. And on that I could actually go to the major mistranslation of the Emerald Tablet that I'll be addressing it in one of my published works very soon, um, but I'm not going to spoil that for you now. The underlying idea is that only God can create souls, and therefore if human beings gain that ability, this proves they have become reunited with their divine essence. Once having done so, they have in fact gained unlimited superpowers. They are gods capable of creating new worlds, and there is literally nothing they cannot accomplish. This perspective is central to Agrippa's third book of occult philosophy, but he must have been well aware that such an extreme doctrine of human deification was quite problematic from orthodox theological perspectives. No doubt, eh? He therefore presents it in a rather enigmatic fashion that is hard to understand unless one can read the coded references to Lazarelli's Christian hermetic message of spiritual divine versus merely human sexual generation reproduction. He begins with a hymn that is copy-pasted from Lazarelli's Crater Hermetis in Lefebvre's edition, and then moves into a prose passage by Agrippa himself. Therefore the begetter, i.e. God, gave man a mind quite like his own, and speech that, having also been given consciousness, would bring forth gods that are truly like gods. They overcome the trials of fate, and chase away destructive illness. They give prophetic dreams. They offer help in man's need. They punish the godless and splendidly reward the pious. Thus they fulfill the command of God the Father. These are the disciples. These are the sons of God, who are born not from the will of the flesh, nor from the will of a man or of a menstruating woman, but from God. But it is a literal generation in which the Son is like the Father in all manner of similitude, and in which the begotten is the same in species as the begetter. And this is the power, given form by the mind and the word rightly received in a well-disposed subject, like semen in the womb, for generation and giving birth. And these things belong to the most recondite secrets of nature, which should not be publicly discussed any further. In short, Agrippa here lifts a tip of the veil that covers the true doctrine his true doctrine, but suggests that these are deep secrets that can be understood only by a spiritual elite. It's the, uh, the Prisca Theologia idea of this true perennial knowledge passed down only by the elite, the Gnostics who know the truth. It's not an idea I'm a big fan of. I like uh, Valentin Tomberg and his meditation on Tarot sort of anthroposophical idea, rather that hermeticists are people that um, can't get there any other way, unlike artists and musicians who can get there through true creativity. Hermeticists are more like disabled people that need this kind of a sh uh, spiritual theosis and hermetic practice in a marginal uh, 
you know, transgressive way so that they can achieve what others can achieve just through creative art and intuition. <laughs> I think that's a, looking at us hermeticists as, as disabled people is, I think, uh, maybe more accurate sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. I certainly think it's ridiculous to look around at that the the occult milieu and and refer to everyone involved as the spiritual elite. It just seems the evidence doesn't support it. I mean, yeah, I mean, are most adept are some of the best people I've met for sure, for sure. Um, but we're just all humans, man. We're all sinners. We're all we're all we're all messed up. It will not come as a surprise then that the most people with whom Agrippa came into contact failed to understand his true intentions to his increasing frustration. A typical example of the wandering Renaissance intellectual, a model next to similar figures such as Paracelsus for Marguerite Yersinier's novel Le Ouvre au Noir, Agrippa essentially spent his whole life looking for wealthy persons, patrons, but never with lasting success. At the time, he, when he started out, it's because he couldn't get a podcast, right? No need for a wealthy patron if you have a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> At the time when he started out as a university lecturer in Dull in 1509, he tried to win the favor of Margaret of Austria with the text on the nobility and preeminence of the female sex that has earned him a reputation of an early feminist. Among other things, he blames Adam, not Eve, for eating the apple in paradise and causing the fall. I, I love that he's an early feminist because he was trying to get money from a woman so wrote about how women are more noble and preeminent than than men. That's great. <laughs> Does it make you a feminist if you're writing that so you can get money from a woman, <laughs> from a patron? I don't know. Due to attacks by the Franciscan prior Jean Catlinet, who accused him of Judaizing heresy, oh, that's a big one, he was forced to leave Dole and eventually ended up in London where he wrote a work on Reuchlin to defend himself against Catilinet, Catiline and prove that learning from the Jews does not evaluate, invalidate one's Christian commitments. In London, he began studying... I mean, if, if, if learning from the Jews invalidated Christian commitments, then learning from Jesus would invalidate Christianity, right? In London, he began studying the epistles of St. Paul, which became an important influence on his subject, subsequent thought. And after a stay in his hometown, Cologne, he went to, on to Italy, where he absorbed much of the new Platonic, Hermetic, and Christian Kabbalistic culture. He lectured at the University of Pavia on Plato's Symposium, as well as Ficino's Pimander, as we have seen. And having married his first Italian wife, he enjoyed one of the happiest periods of his life there. When the French armies invaded the area in 1515, Agrippa was forced to leave and move to Casale. Casale, how do you say that? Here he wrote his treatise on the three ways of knowing God, which is extremely critical of scholastic philosophy and highlights faith rather than reason as the exclusive way to attaining certain knowledge, a conviction that would remain a red thread in his thinking, culminating in his great book on the uncertainty and vanity of all human knowledge. This is a big a tra a trend that, of course, led ultimately to the Reformation and Luther and all of those, that stuff. Faith over works. His last lectures in a university context were given in Turin in 1516 about the epistles of Paul. In 1518, we find Agrippa in Metz working as a public advocate and defense lawyer. Yeah, back then, you could be a doctor or a lawyer, just change, change willy-nilly. It didn't take much education, eh? Obviously, I'm sort of joking. At this time, he was following the arguments of the reformers with great interest and much sympathy, no doubt but would never make the step of converting to the new faith. It is in the same year that he published his text on original sin, with the claim that it had consisted in the sexual act. Still in Metz, he showed considerable courage, especially given his known interest in occult philosophy, by defending a woman accused of witchcraft. While he succeeded in saving her life, his conflicts with the Dominican authorities forced him to leave the city and move back to Cologne with his wife and child. His wife died during their travel to Geneva, where Agrippa found work as a physician. See, now he's a doctor. He was a lawyer, now he's a doctor. Reman remarried just a few months later with a woman who would bear him six further children. Whew. Having moved on to Fribourg in 1523, Agrippa continued his medical practice 
but one year later he made the mistake of accepting a position of physician to Louis of Savoy, Queen Mother of France in Lyon. To his disappointment, the Queen made him write astrological prognostications, but refused to pay his salary, and her courtiers were making fun of Agrippa behind his back. His humiliating experiences in Lyon, next to the fact that his wife was suffering from illness, seemed to have contributed to the pessimist outlook in his great book of skepticism on the uncertainty and vanity, finished in 1526 and first published in 1529. Things began to look better for Agrippa in 1528, when he found employment in Antwerp as advisor and historiographer of Margaret of Austria, finally. Here he also attracted more and more students, including Johannes Veer, Veer, who would later become famous through his pioneering witchcraft tract On the Tricks of Demons, 1563. During the period of relative quiet and happiness, Agrippa was able to devote himself to studying the ancient sciences, and in 1529 he published a collection of theological writings, later expanded with texts on such topics as monasticism and relics. The same year, however, the plague hit Antwerp, killing his wife and causing the official town physicians to flee the city. Again, showing considerable courage, Agrippa stayed to care for the sick, only to be accused of unlicensed practice by his colleagues after the plague was over. Even more problematic for Agrippa, his sponsor, Margaret of Austria, was suspicious of On the Uncertainty and Vanity, and ordered it to be evaluated by the theological faculty of Louvain. The Emperor Charles V was warned against it by his brother Ferdinand, and it was attacked by the theologians of the Sorbonne as well. All this hostility endangered Agrippa's position at the court. He was no longer paid, and he spent a brief time in prison for debt in 1531. Agrippa's first book on occult philosophy was finally published in the same year and evoked considerable hostility as well. The complete three books of occult philosophy finally appeared in 1533, just two years before his death. Agrippa's final years seem to have been difficult. He married for the third time, but his wife betrayed him. He was briefly imprisoned by King Francis in Lyon, and he died while traveling to Grenoble. What can we conclude from the above? The Agrippa of history was a devout Christian who sincerely believed in the compatibility of biblical revelation and hermetic wisdom, saw faith in Jesus Christ as the only way towards true and certain knowledge, and defended an inclusive and understanding of Christianity as the culmination of an ancient wisdom tradition inspired by the divine Logos and originating in very ancient times. The Agrippa of Nemo history, however, looks quite different. Already during his lifetime, he was suspected and accused of heterodoxy and trafficking with demons, and this is how later generations have mainly perceived him. His reputation of a black magician in league with the devil was strongly enhanced by the publication of, in mid-century of a spurious fourth book of occult philosophy, which he didn't write. It is fair to say that while countless authors with occult interests have plundered his three books of occult philosophy for useful information about the magical arts and related topics, perhaps the most notorious example being Francis Barrett's extensive plagiarisms in his volume The Magus, 1801, a major influence on the occult revival of the 19th century. See, this is just so common. Even today we see a lot of books hitting Amazon uh, with a lot of stuff in them, uh, tarot spreads, ritual practices and techniques that were written by adepts I know and, and myself included that are not given any credit whatsoever in just these cut and paste books and getting quite successful, more successful than our works, yeah, even though they're just uh, stealing stuff from materials we wrote and circulated in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, yeah, it's what people do. Theft is alive and well, and I'm doing something by just moving on. You just got to move on. Just keep doing new stuff. So Francis Barrett's Plagiarisms in the Magus 1801. A major influence on the occult revival of the 19th century, very few of them have understood his actual beliefs or shown any real interest in them. In this sense, it must be said that the history of the reception and appropriation of Agrippa's works dwarfs the history of of his influence. Well, at least his work outlived him and has gone on to become quite seminal. I, 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 no one can disagree with that. So he succeeded in some kind of immortality, if not the physical kind he actually sought through his spirituality. Rest in pre peace, Heinrich Mephistopheles Agrippa. 
Thanks for listening.